I ran a bunch of errands yesterday. The final one entailed going to a specific company's office. Unfortunately, there were only two in my area, and I couldn't have made it to the office across town that I prefer before they closed, which left me with the one in the ghetto. It was still broad daylight, and I parked right up against the busy major road in the otherwise empty parking lot, so I assumed nobody would try anything. Wrong. As I get into my car, roll my window down, and as I'm texting my boyfriend to confirm I ran the errand, a woman appears at my window. She was very obviously on drugs, and at first, she was giving me the typical beggar spiel. I'm homeless, I need money, etc. All I had on me was a card, but I had half a salad left from lunch and offered it to her. She seemed content, but continued to ramble on about how she was in labor. She was clearly not even pregnant, by the way. Her husband can't come to the hospital because it's against his religion. She needs a C-section, etc. Then she suddenly leans into my window so that her face is right in mine and goes, I'm having this baby right now, and if you don't help me, I'm going to kill you right here. While shaking a hand inside her hoodie pouch, insinuating to me that she had a weapon inside. At this point, I'm fairly certain if I was to grab my car keys and start trying to drive off without her, she was legitimately going to stab me or do something like jump onto my car and get seriously injured falling off when I got on the highway. So I played along. I promised her I'd take her to the hospital and waited until she got in to start the car. I headed towards the hospital, intentionally squealing tires away from green lights, going 15 over the limit and driving as shittily but safely as possible in hopes of a cop pulling me over to save me from this hell. She remained perfectly still with her hand in her hoodie pouch, rambling on about things like she's been pregnant since 2017. Her husband will murder her for having this baby. I'm going to die if it doesn't survive, etc. Suddenly, she erupts into a god-awful speech, starts kicking my dash, and demands to know why I'm going the way I am. Because Taco Bell is the other way. I'm like... I thought you were wanting to go to the hospital to have the baby. And she tells me no. The baby needs food and reminds me that if it starves, she's going to watch me bleed out. At this point, I'm not sure if she's bluffing or if she was actually serious about the death threats since I couldn't physically see her weapon. But regardless, I wanted to get as far away from her as possible. So I pulled into a grocery store parking lot and told her I was going to go get her soda and food for the baby. Luckily, she agreed to that. So I locked her in the car, hid behind a pillar at the front of the store, and called the police. They got her out of my car and calmed her down enough to where she'd sit still enough to be questioned her for a while. I couldn't hear what they were saying, but they were very patient with her as she was trying to kick their legs and I could hear her screeching occasionally. Eventually, one approached me for my statement, told me I did the right thing by not upsetting her, and thanked me for calling for help instead of escalating the situation. He escorted me back to the car after making sure I was physically and mentally okay to drive, and as I was heading down the highway towards my house, a bunch of ambulances were tearing down the road towards the grocery store I'd parked at. I haven't seen anything on the news, and I haven't received any calls from the PD yet, but I hope everything turned out okay and she didn't hurt herself or someone else. This happened around four months ago. I debated over whether or not I should even post it considering for a time. I wasn't sure if I was just being paranoid considering I watch a lot of true crime. Looking back now, it creeps me out to think of what could have happened if I hadn't acted how I did. Yeah, sure, I could still be paranoid, but something in my gut says I'm not. I get to my back gate from a small path at the start of a creek just off a of main road. You can go the longer way around to get to my front door, but usually, I just take the back gate because it's quicker. The creek is on the left side of the path, surrounded by trees. The local council has a problem with how many bats live there. The right side of the path is the backs of the houses. Some have gates like mine. If you follow the main road for a bit, there's an underpass that is always covered with graffiti. It always gets painted over only for more graffiti to appear, and the cycle continues. I was hanging out with a friend. We went on a bike ride and had a picnic before school would start back up again. 
It had gotten pretty dark by the time I was heading back. I went through the underpass, which in itself is a sketchy thing to do at night, especially considering I'm a 16 year old, 5 foot 4 female. I got onto the main road, started riding the bicycle lane, and noticed all the bats in the sky. It was rather pretty, actually. I also noticed two cars by the curb on the other side of the road with their lights on. One of the cars was black and had tinted windows, and another was a bigger four-wheel drive car, also black with tinted windows that had a mattress tied to the roof. I just assumed someone was having a party or whatever and kept biking. I heard cars behind me, but that's not unusual considering it's a main road. Even if it does get pretty quiet at night, they slowed down so they were driving behind me, which was odd. I was guessing it was just because they didn't want to hit me. I mean, no one was on the other side of the road. I was in the bicycle lane. They could have overtaken me if they had wanted to. I found myself biking even faster because I felt bad I was the only reason they were driving so slow. As I was thinking this, a car overtook me, but it didn't speed off or anything. They remained driving at my speed just in front of me. It was then I noticed there had been a car behind that car that was also driving at my speed but just behind me. Needless to say, I felt pretty creeped out being sandwiched between these two cars when I realized they were the same ones that were parked on the other side of the road earlier. The fact they were pretty much the same exact sort of car you think of when you think of a creepy car didn't help either. I kept biking till I got to the path by the creek I usually take to get to my back gate. I was having second thoughts though. It was dark, not many people take that path, and it was surrounded by trees. Not to mention how creeped out I felt by what was happening with these cars. I thought it would be best if I turned down the path because these cars would probably just keep driving. But the second I thought that, the four-wheel drive in front of me indicated to go into the curb just up in front of the path. No, nope, not happening. No way was I going down the path now, considering there was no reason someone would pull up there. There wasn't an entrance to anyone's house nearby, or anything except the darkness of the creek. I was going to go the long way around. I overtook the four-wheel drive that had now pulled into the curb to continue along the bicycle lane the long way to my house. As I overtook the four-wheel drive, it indicated to leave the curb. They hadn't even been there ten seconds. They pulled out as the car that was still behind me stopped to let them out. The four-wheel drive went back to sandwiching me with the other car. Pretty much any remaining thought I had of this all being a coincidence went out the window. I turned up a path that goes by the main road. When the cars noticed I did this, they too indicated. By this point, my heart was beating so fast. I came up with a split second plan. I needed to turn left at the T intersection to get to my house, but I didn't want to risk these cars knowing where I lived. So I continued going straight, pretending I wasn't going to turn. They continued also. When it was no longer possible for them to take a left, I did a quick turn and sped down my street. I heard both of the cars speed off as well. I don't think I've ever biked faster in my life. I flung open the front gate, and as I closed it behind me, and my bike, I heard speeding cars approaching my street from the left. I panicked and ducked down, peering through the gap in my fence. I had a sinking feeling. I knew what cars would come past. Sure enough, the black four-wheel drive and other black cars sped past. I don't know what they wanted, but I'm glad I didn't have to find out. A couple years ago, I, 25 female, was solo backpacking in France and made a day trip out to Versailles from Paris. You have to take two separate trains to both get out there and get back. I got on my first train heading back from Versailles and my phone was at 3%, so I had it on airplane mode and low power, but had my headphones in without anything playing to deter people from approaching me. John didn't care. He came over and sat beside me. Speaking to me in French, I'd been walking around the gardens all day and wasn't really in the mood to entertain anyone, so I pretended I didn't understand French. He pulled out his phone and went on to Google Translate, asking if I wanted to learn French. I responded with, no thank you, and went to put my headphones back in and appear even more uninterested, since my body language wasn't enough for him. He continued to ask me questions through his phone, the next one being, where are you sleeping? I lied 
and said that I was in a large hotel with my family and was heading back to them. He asked where it was, and all I replied with was, Paris. He then asked if I was getting off at a specific stop of the subway, which I said yes to, another lie, and he said that he'd go with me. I immediately said no, and ended the conversation. I got my headphones in and completely closed him off from talking to me, which prompted him to leave me alone for a couple minutes. He then got on a phone call and said to his friend, Yeah, I'll get off at the stop, and you go to the other stop. This set off the danger alarm in my head because the other stop is the actual stop I was getting off at. We got to the transfer station, and he got up and off the train and waited for me at the doors. I took my sweet ass time getting up and making sure I had everything, to the point that it was very obvious I was doing it on purpose. He then left to go get on the other train, and I slowly made my way off into the next train. I mean, painfully slow. I got on the train at the very front and was watching everyone around me to make sure that nobody was being suspicious or watching me, to the point that they all probably thought I was on something. We get to the first stop, and I'm watching the people going off and coming on, as well as anyone on the platform, but I see no sign of him or anyone paying much attention to me. We get off at the other stop, and I get off with the crowd, turn the corner, and he's there with four friends scanning everyone coming out. I turned around so fast and went the exact opposite way, taking my hair out of my bun and trying to change my appearance as much as I possibly could. As soon as I get out of the train station, I ran back to my hostel and refused to leave it until I was with one of my roommates. When I was a teenager, I got my very first job, which was a newspaper delivery route that I would do after school twice a week. I really enjoyed the job when I began it, and would occasionally interact with the people who I was delivering the newspapers to, and they all seemed friendly during our short interactions. I had a cart that fit all the newspapers for my route in it, which I would drag down the sidewalk. I had my route for several months, when one afternoon, I was doing my route, and a man was walking down the sidewalk. He greeted me, stated that I must be the newspaper girl, and asked if I had delivered a newspaper to his house yet, pointing at it down the street. I replied that I hadn't. He suggested that I pass him his newspaper there, rather than needing to go down his driveway to deliver it in a few minutes. I handed him a paper, and expected him to continue walking along to his house. I bent down to grab more newspapers out of my cart, and thought that I felt something hit my butt. When I straightened back up, he was walking away from me, with his newspaper rolled up in his hand. At the time, I really hadn't expected anyone to intentionally hit me on the butt with a rolled up newspaper, and dismiss it as either an accident or a figment of my imagination. The next week, while doing my route, he was sitting on his front deck, and watched me walk down the sidewalk, delivering newspapers to his neighbors. When I came down his driveway, he wolf whistled at me, and said, Here comes the mermaid. I came up onto his deck to hand him the newspaper, and immediately turned to leave afterwards to continue my route. He tried to engage me in conversation as I was leaving, and I said, I'm sorry, but I have to finish my route. Well, I thought that this interaction was odd, I didn't think too much of it at the time. One of the regulations that I was supposed to follow for my route was to make sure that the newspapers were either placed in the customer's mailbox or put somewhere safe. Long before I had met the customer, I had established a pattern of putting his newspaper behind the deck chair beside his front door, up on his deck. The next time that I delivered, I didn't see the man and planned to put the newspaper in its usual spot and go on my way as usual. As I climbed the steps of his deck, his dogs barked at me through the window, which was normal. But as I was turning to leave, suddenly the door opened, and the man was standing there, and he tried to engage me in conversation. But I told him again that I needed to finish my route. This became the start of a pattern, and every single time that I delivered the newspaper to his house, he was waiting near the door and opened it as soon as I was coming up the steps of his deck. He had never came out of his house when I was delivering before he met me on the sidewalk that one time, but now, he happened to be right at the door, as if waiting for me every single time. The longer the pattern continued, the more that I realized that his behavior was not normal, and I became really uneasy, and wished to not interact with him unless absolutely necessary. One day, as I was doing my route, I noticed that one of his deck chairs had moved to the side of his deck, 
near his driveway. I realized that I could walk a few steps down his driveway and put the newspaper under the chair without stepping onto his deck at all. Since I didn't go onto the deck, the dogs didn't bark, and he wasn't alerted that I was there, and he didn't open the door to try to talk to me as I gave him the paper. I thought that this was great, and I felt a lot more comfortable delivering to his house since I wasn't interacting with him anymore. Then one day, the deck chair was moved, and it was put on the other side of the deck. I hadn't forgotten the reason why I didn't want to step foot on his deck, and I decided to put the newspaper in the same spot that I had been putting it for several weeks, even though the chair wasn't there to secure it. I crossed the street to deliver to the next house, and just as I was stepping onto the next customer's driveway, he stepped out of his house, looked at the newspaper, grabbed it, and shook it as he showed it at me across the street. He was yelling that the newspaper was about to blow away and become litter all down the road, despite the fact that there was no wind at all that day. I stood there and listened to him screaming at me in shock, unable to respond. He continued to scream that I was never to leave the newspaper anywhere on his deck, not even under a chair, but that I had to open his door and bring the newspaper inside. Thankfully, at this point, the woman whose driveway I was standing in opened her door and began to yell back at the man that he needed to stop screaming at me, and that she was sure that I had done nothing wrong. The man glared at her and finally went back into his house. The woman talked with me a moment, telling me to not pay that man any attention. I was really scared and upset. As soon as that man told me that he wanted me to put the newspaper inside his house, I was starting to get some really bad vibes. And I was unable to shake it. I grabbed my cart and went home without finishing my round, since I didn't feel safe being anywhere near his house. Back home, I lived at my uncle and aunt's house during this time. My cousin asked me why I was home so early, and I told her what had happened, including all of the previous weird interactions. I never had a normal interaction with him and broke down crying, barely able to say my fear that I thought that he wanted to do stuff with me. My aunt overheard part of our conversation and my cousin helped me fill her in on the rest of it. I told my aunt that I had no clue what to do because I had believed that not delivering a newspaper to him was not an option. I also felt that I had no proof to back up my feeling that he wanted to do stuff with me, since nothing concretely implying that had happened and I assumed that most people would dismiss his individual actions like I had initially done. My aunt, however, told me that she would call the newspaper that I delivered for and inform them that I would no longer be delivering to his house. My male cousin and uncle finished my route for me that night. The next time I was supposed to deliver, my male cousin came out with me to deliver to the houses near that man's house, doing that section of my route first. Rather than in the middle like before, there was a day when I was walking down that road by myself, not delivering papers, and the guy was driving down the road in his truck. He slowed down and yelled out of his window at me, trying to get my attention, but I refused to turn my head to look at him or acknowledge him in any way and just kept walking. Finally, he gave up and drove off. Thankfully, that was my final interaction with him. My male cousin continued to deliver that section of the route with me, until I felt comfortable delivering by myself. Since I had developed a pattern of delivering my papers so that I never stepped foot on the sidewalk directly in front of his house, when summer came, I got a summer job, and the next school year, I asked for a different route. It's been years since I moved out of my uncle and aunt's house and out of that town. The last time I was in that town, I decided to take a walk down some of the streets where I delivered for nostalgic purposes, and I still felt a shiver of fear. As I passed by that man's house, even though I was walking on the sidewalk on the other side of the street, and I didn't see him at all. I still don't know if he would have attempted anything inappropriate with me if I had followed his wish and stepped into his house, but I had a bad gut feeling, and do not feel guilty at all for listening to it. He hopefully wouldn't recognize me this many years later, since I am an adult now, but I still hope that I will never meet him again. I'm a 27 year old woman, and this happened to me 9 or 10 years ago. When I was a senior in high school, we lived in a pretty large house, but my siblings were all away at college or boarding school, so it was only my parents and I in the house. I'm a crazy light sleeper, so when I woke up in the dark, 
and saw my alarm clock flashing 3.11 a.m., I wasn't too surprised. However, I was wide awake, not just groggily stirring in my sleep. I lay there, wondering what had woken me, when I heard very soft footsteps on the stairs outside my bedroom. The door to my room was parallel to the left side of the bed, and I happened to be laying with my back to the door. When the footsteps approached my door, I thought it must be one of my parents, checking on me for some reason, and the doorknob was turned. So, so slowly. Still, I thought they were just trying not to wake me. The door began to open again, slowly and carefully. It made a creaking noise, no matter how slowly it was opened, so the person finally just shoved it the rest of the way to silence the creak. Still, my naive brain thought it was one of my parents, until they clicked on a flashlight. I froze. Terror flooded me. And I remember that I instantly broke out in a sweat. They were behind me, and I was facing away, so they couldn't see my eyes wide open as they shone the beam straight on me. I always used to think that if something like that ever happened, I would be such a badass and I would whip out of bed and punch them, attack them, shout, scream, do something. But I could do nothing at all. All I could do was try to keep my breathing deep and even, despite the pounding of my heart so that the intruder wouldn't know I was awake. After about 10 seconds, they finally moved the light away. I prayed and begged and bartered with anything that would listen to me as the intruder walked around my room, looking at my things. I could vaguely see their shape large and bulky, like they were wearing two coats. They had a baseball cap on. They didn't shine the flashlight on me again, and after a few minutes, which felt like an eternity, they left my room. I could still hear them, though, walking around the rest of the second floor. Through my siblings' empty bedrooms, I was still sweating, still frozen in terror, not knowing what to do. I wanted to grab my phone and call my dad, sleeping downstairs. I wanted to call our landline, so the phone would ring and wake my parents up. I wanted to call the police. I wanted to get up and run from my room. I wanted to cry, but I couldn't do any of those things. I was afraid that they would hear me. And I didn't know if they had a weapon or would try to hurt me or my parents. I wouldn't wish such helpless terror on my worst enemy. I don't know how, but I must have passed out from fear. Or the adrenaline wore off and I fell asleep somehow. Because the next thing I knew... It was 6 a.m., and I could hear my parents downstairs. I ran downstairs, and as calmly as I could, I asked if one of them had been in my room last night. Their faces went blank, and they said no, they hadn't. That was the last straw. I broke down in sobs and told them, and someone was in my room last night. Even as I typed this, my hands would begun shaking, and I've teared up. The police were called, even though there was little they could do at that point. Apparently when my parents woke up, all of the doors to the outside were standing wide open, and there was a duffel bag at the bottom of the stairs. All that was inside was a coil of nylon rope and an empty USB flash drive. I don't want to think what that was for. The intruder hadn't taken anything, and we have no idea why they left in what appeared to be a hurry. It took me about a week to be able to sleep in my own room, a sanctuary which felt violated and frightening to me now. I carry pepper spray sleep with a machete next to my bed, and double-check my locks every night. Hopefully this will never happen again, but if it does, hopefully I won't freeze. It's been ten years, and my most common nightmare is that someone is in my room, standing in the shadows, watching me.